Welcome to this presentation for PLEWA. I'm Alex Rosier, Head of Humanities at Shenton College. And uh, the purpose of this presentation is to uh, identify areas of concern uh, that do appear in which students present the wrong information uh, that may be legacy things taught to them by HAS or non-HAS teachers in primary school, middle school, uh, which carries over into the year 11 and 12 course, and of course would cost the students marks when it comes to the ATAR exam. We'll talk about a range of, of topics, and you are welcome to, to ask questions. If you can type them in, uh, they'll be brought to my attention. I'll do my best to to answer those questions. I will point out this is not for how to pick up extra marks or strategies for study or anything like that. It really is about the common misconceptions that are presented to students or that students present uh, in their ATAR exam. We will offer a range of uh, other seminars, including um, student revision seminars, which I suspect will be held later this term. I'll ask the Vice President, Lisa. No, Nothing planned at the moment. Okay, so something may be disseminated soon from the next PLEWA meeting. And of course, also PLEWA will offer a variety of exams and past exams, which people are welcome to buy. Okay, so let's get started. First thing we're gonna look at are uh, the, uh, the bread and butter of our course in seeing the application of the political legal concepts and that's high court. Common mistake with Marbo is less and less often we see this, but it still appears. And that is that we see that Marbo is referred to as a constitutional decision. I don't know where this came from, but it certainly does appear. Marbo is a common law decision. It's a decision that overturned the uh, previous legal position of terra nullius, that is empty land. And because it overturned a significant legal uh, position of the courts, we would consider it a significant case uh, in that it did not maintain stare decisis. Other areas of significance for this case is that it's an excellent example of judicial statutory interpretation in which the legislature um, recognized the judiciary had established common law and created a statute law in which to define it better and to also determine uh, what a court hierarchy would be to determine uh, native title. It has led to further high court cases as well, adding to its significance, Wicks, uh, WIC and more recently, Toms and Love. Uh, and I would encourage uh, politics and law teachers to watch the space in relation to Toms and Love, and uh, in particular, the tripart test for Aboriginality, which I'll talk about fairly soon. So that's Marbo covered, common law, not constitutional, and it is certainly a significant case. Plaintiff S157, common area of mistake for students here is that they think that the Commonwealth was attempting to uh, unlawfully deport a person seeking asylum, that it's a refugee asylum seekers case, et cetera, et cetera. Really the crux of the Plaintiff S157 is that it's a judicial case. Uh, I think you've just lost my video. I'm not too sure, something's just changed on my screen, um, but I'll keep going. Plaintiff S157 is a judicial review case of the judiciary. That is its significance. Yep. Um, generally speaking, students look at it from a very complex arrangement and as I try to talk about privative clauses, I don't think privative clauses are really a big thing. I don't think the students are gonna get what is a privative clause in an exam. But to understand what a privative clause is, it's simply that the parliament establishes in statute what courts can hear what cases relating to the interpretation of statutes. When they choose to limit the, uh, the reach of appeals, it's known as a privative clause. That is that they channel the appeals towards certain courts or tribunals and they end there. Where our students go wrong is that they claim that the Commonwealth sought to deny the High Court the right to hear an appeal from the Refugee Review Tribunal. This is not the case. The Solicitor General did not argue that the High Court did not have the jurisdictional authority to hear an appeal. I would urge teachers to get students away from that idea that the Commonwealth tried to stop the High Court from hearing an appeal. They did not argue such a case. In fact, what was really being argued with Plaintiff S157 is that the um, pending dis impending decision of a minister to deport a person for failing to properly demonstrate refugee status and get a protection visa um, could not go ahead because the Refugee Review Tribunal had not actually met. Now, at the time, it looked like the RRT had met, it had made its decision, the minister by law would have to act upon that decision. Unfortunately, um, or fortunately, it turned out that the RRT did not properly convene. 
And so therefore the High Court maintained uh, a really good common law principle of the right to a fair trial, maintained the common law principle of due process, and that a person cannot be uh, found guilty, um, a claim against a person cannot proceed if the court is not properly constituted. So in the case of Plaintiff 157, what we're really looking at here is the judiciary, the High Court, holding the judiciary, in this instance, the Refugee Review Tribunal to account for failing to have properly convened and yet seeking to enforce a decision. Uh, I've included there for you, uh, Clayton Utes, I can recommend is a really good website to explain some of the more complex areas of the court systems and cases we discuss. Moving on, Dietrich. Um, this is a problem for a number of students, sorry, a uh, number of students, including one of my own who very recently uh, in an exam identified that Dietrich provides uh, the right to legal representation in courts. First up, it's not a constitutional decision. Dietrich is a common law decision. Um, there was an allusion in the obita dicta uh, by one of the justices of the High Court that section 80 could be relevant, but it did not form part of the binding decision of the court. So it sits as an obita rather than a ratio. Dietrich, not being constitutional and therefore common law is significant in that the parliaments can choose if they wish to overturn it, they have not. So where students go wrong with Dietrich is that they claim that A, it's a constitutional decision and B, that uh, all people have the right to legal representation, particularly in a serious inductive offence. To address those two areas, one, as I've said, it's common law. It does not draw on the constitution in the court's ratio. Secondly, it does not talk about legal representation being a right. Instead, um, Justice Dean uh, identifies that for a person to be convicted of a crime, there needs to be a fair trial according to law. And in the instance of Dietrich, that fair trial in accordance with law did not happen. What it does mean that uh, courts need to stay trials should a person uh, incapable of providing for their own defence um, does not have defence. So it's left to states and the Commonwealth to increasingly fund legal aid services so that those charged with serious indictable offences can receive appropriate legal representation, fulfilling the um, common law concept of a fair trial. The trial can then proceed um, and hopefully justice would be served. So the take out from that, it's not constitutional and it is not the right to legal representation. It is the right to a fair trial. And my last one of high court cases that students sometimes get wrong is the complexities of the uniform tax case. Uh, I'm looking at 1942, not 1957. Uh, generally, students seem to claim that uh, the Commonwealth took over the power of income tax and that the high court ruled that the Commonwealth could do so. You could argue that they did, but uh, students would need to be quite clear in a written response as to what they mean by takeover. Effectively, what the uh, Commonwealth did was that it accessed section 51, subsection two. I put it down there as subsection I, it should be double I. It's a concurrent power. The Commonwealth may make law on taxation and the states may also make law on taxation. In this instance though, the Commonwealth had always left income tax to the states and uh, the Commonwealth received its income through company tax, uh, bounties, etc., etc. But in order to finance the prosecution of the war, the Commonwealth needed um, a more secure and stable source of income, so it introduced an income tax law. Where it became contentious is that they placed it under four steps. Um, I can't remember them perfectly, but effectively it was that all uh, those relevant to income tax would have to pay the Commonwealth before they paid a state their income tax that uh, should a state continue to charge an income tax, uh, they would have whatever revenue generated from that deducted from their grants that they would be given. And really that was the key area that the states were arguing. They were losing in effect their power to charge a tax by the Commonwealth covering the field. That is, you pay your tax to the Commonwealth first, the states come last, and that should states generate income through income tax, they would lose through the Commonwealth grants uh, that they would ordinarily have been entitled to. So ineffectively, a uniform tax case, perfectly legitimate for the Commonwealth to do it. They did not take away the power of the states to charge income taxes, nor did the states, as I have seen on some occasions, surrender their taxation powers. They, they certainly didn't. I know some states take a lot of joy in surrendering powers to the Commonwealth, but certainly taxation is not going to be one of them. Um, and that really the Commonwealth uses the concept of covering the field, that is that the Commonwealth comes first. Okay, I'm just going to move now on to my next one, and that's 
common areas of misunderstanding in relation to political participation. And the key one that comes up is Aboriginals. Lots of people use um, Aboriginal experiences as a human rights topic towards the end of Unit 4. And for me, this is an area where a lot of students um, coming through having been taught very badly on Australian uh, democratic history and in particular on Aboriginal history uh, of the 20th century, I'd really like to cover this one. First and foremost, there is not and there never has been a Flora and Fauna Act. It is not part of the Constitution. I've heard some people argue that it comes under the Race Power Section 51 or that Section 127 of the Constitution was effectively a Flora and Fauna Act. They are not the case. The Commonwealth nor any state has ever instituted such a thing. Secondly, the timeline of uh, political participation for Aboriginal people. Uh, I've certainly seen a number of occasions in which um, people will talk about how Aboriginals weren't given the vote to vote since 1967. In fact, uh, returned service personnel, 1949, had the right to vote in Commonwealth elections. Then the uh, option, voluntary voting, uh, under the change to the Electoral Act in 1962, and uh, under the Hawke government, including Aboriginal voting as uh, mandatory, uh, compulsory voting in 1983. The 1967 feature was the removal of Section 127 from the Constitution. Uh, and doesn't really extend to voting rights unless you want to look at um, being counted as part of the national census for referendum. Uh, another feature there, citizenship. Uh, prior to 1949, January 26, 1949, uh, we were not Australian citizens. We were British subjects under the Nationality Act and we shared such um, status with Britons, New Zealanders and Canadians. We could effectively move from country to country and enjoy the full franchise rights of our new country that we went to without actually having to be naturalised as a citizen. Uh, this changed in 1949, in which uh, late 1948 under Chifley government, and then in, uh, later, um, actually it was still under the Chifley government into early January 1949, the Citizenship Act came into effect. And that made everybody an Australian rather than one particular group, which some students could get wrong. Uh, just a terminology note, if you read any decision of the High Court, and if you read the Constitution, it refers to Aboriginal rather than Indigenous or Aboriginal Australians. And lastly, something just to bring to your, to your attention is that the notion of Aboriginality is not defined by statute. Uh, as far as I'm aware, it's actually based on Mabo number two, that is the Mabo tripartite test uh, established in the Mabo case of 1992, which requires certain things to be demonstrated to the court's satisfaction that a person claims uh, Aboriginality. This has been particularly highlighted by Toms and Love, uh, and that's why I say politics teachers watch this space to see what the parliament may do in relation to the Aboriginality test. Hopefully I've cleared up that one. I'm getting a nod from Lisa. Thanks, Lisa. Moving on, interpreting the constitution. I'm going really fast, so I might slow down. Interpreting the constitution. First up, there is no informal change to the Constitution. The Constitution is either changed or it is not changed. And the only way to change the Constitution is through Section 128. What I would encourage teachers to do is to teach their students a phrase. For my students, it's changes to our understanding of the Constitution, rather than saying we have informally changed the Constitution. Because in real terms, what changes is our understanding of the document? Most notably, that will come through how the High Court interprets the Constitution. And that is therefore the change, the understanding according to uh, the adjudicator's decision, their interpretation. And on occasion, the High Court makes some interesting constitutional conflicting decisions. Excuse me just a moment, can I get that door closing? Um, uh, sorry about that. The High Court, I think if you were to look at decisions such as uh, freedom of political communication under section seven and 24, um, you will see that uh, we have established freedom of political expression. But if you want to look further into that, you would look at Theophanus and Long, which actually takes our understanding of the Constitution in different directions and then brings it back in again. And now we also have the case of Brown versus Tasmania, which extends as well, our understanding of the constitutional right to political expression. So the High Court changes our understanding, but students should also be aware that the High Court changes its own understanding on occasion over the decades as they pass. And just as a heads up for a lot of people, sorry. I shall do. I've been asked by Lisa if you want to ask questions. I think, Lisa, you'll find there is somebody. Uh, I've got a Q&A panel pop, but 
I have to open it. Informal change of the contribution features quite heavily in the textbook. I don't know who, uh, Ben, yeah, it may do, but that's the textbook, not um, the syllabus. So um, I think we use the term informal changes as a means to teach, but I would still encourage people to get their students away from the term informal changes and instead focus on the notion of changing our understanding of. So we, we will use that term informal changes as a shorthand of saying our understanding of the constitution. has. Um, that's my advice. Uh, just get your students to practice writing that short phrase rather than using those two words together. Finally, I'd also talk about um, that high courts, a lot of students will say the high court's original jurisdiction of the constitution is set by section 76I. In actual fact, it's set by the Judiciary Act of 1903. 76 is actually says that the Commonwealth Parliament may make the High Court the Court of Original Jurisdiction on the following areas. It doesn't actually say that it has to. If the Commonwealth Parliament wished to, they could establish their own constitutional court to interpret the constitution. Uh, of course, that court would be subject, could be subject to appeal under section 73. It's an area of academic interest. But if you want to be precise on the original jurisdiction of the constitution being held by the High Court, it's not by Section 76i, it's actually through the Judiciary Act of 1903. Again, if you have any questions or if you want me to slow down, please tell me. I'm talking fast because uh, I'm going to lose my voice at some point soon. Um, also, unchallenged legislation does not change our understanding of the Constitution as much as our understanding of, of federalism. And an area where students get things wrong is that they kind of tend to link changes to the Constitution informal changes, formal changes, and then they link it to federalism and they try and put the two together. I would encourage people, uh, teachers, to ensure that their students, we're talking about changing our understanding of the constitution, and there is a corollary effect that it changes our understanding of federalism, but it's not automatically the same. Um, and then finally, referral of powers does not alter the constitution. It alters the legislative power of the Commonwealth but the referral of power itself does not um, become a head of power under section 51. So uh, the constitution is not rewritten merely that the head of powers of the Commonwealth are enhanced. Um, also, the Commonwealth does not have to accept a referral of power if it doesn't wish to. And um, an interesting feature of it is that that power that's been referred is a phantom part of section 51. It's kind of there, but it's not changed in the writing of the constitution. Um, that would require a referendum. And if you look at 25, I'm thinking is it 25A is um, social security and welfare. They were constitutional provisions to change rather than referring. Um, once a power has been referred under section 51, that originating state can continue to legislate on it if they choose. It's just that the Commonwealth would automatically overturn it if they want. Uh, now, moving on to, this is going to go a lot quicker than I was expecting, moving on to a, a, another area, and that's executive accountability. And I'm sure anybody who's uh, marked for a while, if there's any uh, markers of the ATAR papers out there, I don't know who you are, because we're not allowed to know. I'm sure you would agree that question time is a headache. The key mistake that students make about question time uh, is, is that they see it as a legislative accountability. I'm not sure where that comes from. It's a legislative mechanism. I should say a legislature mechanism of holding the executive branch accountable. So please try to keep your students aware that question time might belong to the parliament, but it is about holding the executive accountable. Um, question time is um, often seen as being wonderful in the Senate because the Senate is balanced and the Senate has to be controlled by the government and the opposition and the crossbenchers all work in harmony, holding hands, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, I'm going to disprove a bit of that through a couple of these slides. There are problems with question time in the Senate. Ministers assisting, because they're ministers assisting, don't necessarily have the briefings they need and therefore they will defer a question and take it as a question with notice. Um, many senior ministers, which is where your most contentious uh, portfolios are located, are usually in the House of Reps, starting uh, on the Treasury benches with the Prime Minister and the Treasurer. That's usually why your Minister for Foreign Affairs is a Senator, so that way the Treasury benches are represented in the Senate. But most of the senior ministers will sit in the House, and because in most circumstances the House is dominated by the executive, they're fairly good at avoiding the scrutiny. So by not having senior ministers sit in the Senate, it means that senior ministers can avoid the more effective scrutiny of question time. Uh, I haven't put it here on the slide. One of the good features about the Senate's um, 
the question time is that they're allowed supplementary questions. So once a minister has answered a question, uh, a, uh, the sponsor of the question has the opportunity to ask a follow-up question based on the minister's response. We don't get that in the House, so it's actually a good feature of the Senate. Um, I want to point out here, and I have it in another slide, that students do inflate the effectiveness of the Senate. They should not forget that the Senate is a party political chamber. It is comprised of people who are career politicians. It's comprised of people who have grand visions for Australia. It's comprised of people who have responsibilities to seek to pursue their party's policies. And politics is all cut and thrust. The Senate may seem to be a more sedate chamber uh, because of the lack of executive dominance. Um, but at the end of the day, um, if you have a conservative government, Greens and Labor will behave politically against that government. If you have a, a Labor government, you might find One Nation um, and Liberals and Nationals uh, not being as polite as people might think they are. They have their own political agendas. It's just that the, the Senate functions at a different speed and a different pace. But I'd encourage teachers to take away from students the idea that the Senate is this marvellous place where politicians have a lovely picnic and get on well with each other. Okay, I might just take a drink. And again, Lisa's asking me if you have any questions. I have another one. Nope, it's still the same one. I'm just going to close the video so you don't see me drinking. Okay, sorry about that. Um, there we go. I should be heard now, hopefully. Yep, that's all come up. All right, powers of the Governor-General. The Constitution prescribes a, a nice list, most of them, Chapter 2 uh, of the Governor-General. I'll point out at this point um, that a lot of students forget the Governor-General is also a part of the legislature under Section 2. So um, a tip there for people, and it's not here on the slide, is that if students are looking at who the Governor-General is constitutionally, Almost all of them will focus on chapter two, which is uh, good to focus on chapter two. That's, that's a really big part of it, but no good answer should go without uh, mentioning um, the legislative powers of the Governor General. That is uh, the fact that they represent the Queen, who is cited first and foremost uh, in section one, the establishment of the Parliament, um, their ability to suspend and dissolve Parliament, to deny royal assent, which never happened, of course, and of course to, to call for a double dissolution. Um, all of those are legislative powers of the Governor General. So if students are going to be talking about powers of the GG, I I'd be recommending that they break it up into three tranches. First up, they would want to take it perhaps constitutionally in order. So they might want to talk about the legislative powers of the Governor General. Uh, then they would talk about the executive powers of the Governor General coming under chapter two. And that's, that's really the constitutional and political executive, which is probably the main reason why most of our students study the course. And then you've got uh, chapter three, which is a singular power, two powers, I should say, of the Governor General. One is the appointment um, uh, on advice of the justices of the courts, and uh, also uh, receiving a prayer from uh, a joint sitting of parliament to remove uh, a justice of the courts as well. So powers of the Governor General extend beyond just chapter two. Good students should be able to talk about the three branches. Um, an area for me that I, I particularly enjoy, I ended up having a student do it, but she lost count. It went over well over a thousand. Most students look at, uh, almost all students will look at the constitutional powers because the syllabus actually prescribes what the constitutional powers are. But the syllabus doesn't prescribe only. It actually says that students should look at the powers of the Governor General, including the constitutional powers on list section 62, 63, 64, etc. The Governor General has enormous power. The vast bulk of legislation passed by the Parliament actually empowers the Governor General in Council. Uh, there are those really emergency items such as the Defence Act, in which the Governor General is not needing to be advised in Council, but they are for emergencies. But the fact that the Governor General is actually the person in whom statutory power and authority is uh, placed is significant. 
So when the governor general issues uh, new orders in relation to the regulations of the public service, that's not a constitutional one, that's a statutory power. When they are invoking features of say, um, officer training for the defence force, that's coming under the statutory powers under the, um, the Defence Act. If they want to change the flag, that's coming under the Flag Act. They're not constitutional. So the Governor General has a lot of very, very important statutory powers. If you wanted to use a couple of them recently, um, their power to call a Royal Commission comes under the 1901 Royal Commissions Act. Um, their management of the senior public service, removing a senior public servant comes under the Public Service uh, Amendment Act 2013. So they, ha they have those ones. One of my favourite ones, which it sounds a bit strange, why anybody would consider the Minister's Estate Act to be a favourite piece of legislation, but it's really relevant for Section 64 of our course, and I'll talk about that in just a moment. But the Governor-General power are beyond the Constitution. They also include statute. My advice to the students, don't spend a lot of time talking about statutes, but if they want to go for those richer marks, they should be identifying that outside of Chapters 1, 2 and 3, the Governor-General has statutory powers. Um, I've also put in here something that doesn't come up a great deal in, in past textbooks because it hasn't really been a problem. Generally, we enjoy governments with executive dominance, but 2010 and 13 and uh, a couple of months for Scott Morrison, government held a minority. And following the 2010 election, Julia Gillard needed to um, assure the Governor General Quentin Bryce that she was in a position to move on from caretaker prime minister and return to being prime minister with confidence of the house which i'll talk about in a moment but every now and then the governor general will need to be involved in the formation of government this happens in the case of 2010 uh, sorry uh yep 2010 election or in the case of uh the member for wentworth resigning and the seat being won by an independent leaving the government with no majority the governor general needs to ensure and therefore approach the prime minister and say you need to confirm you have confidence or i may need to speak to the leader of the opposition right the prime minister i actually don't have a pri i've got boris johnson behind me as prime minister i can't get a cardboard cut out of scott morrison i might ask him to stand for a photo and take one so the prime minister Great comment that students have uh, here at teachers from other learning areas talk about these types of things, thinking they know what they're talking about. The prime minister does not exist in law. That would be a big surprise to our prime ministers, especially when they spend taxpayers money on all sorts of things. The prime minister does exist in law. They are not stated in the constitution. I'll be absolutely upfront with that. They are not in the constitution. Section 64 provides that the governor general appoints ministers of state and they must be members of parliament within three months of their appointment. To enhance, because of our minimalist constitution, we've had to create an act, it's called the Ministers of State Act, and this refines the power of the Governor General, uh, which is very much uh, followed by convention, in who will be ministers. It sets their salaries, it sets how many may be appointed, how many the Governor General may uh, choose to change it by. It actually is a Governor General power to determine the size of the Cabinet Ministry, and it actually uh, identifies how many can be um, ministers assisting and how many will be ministers. That's the Ministers of State Act. And by convention, the Governor General will appoint someone to be at the top of the Ministers of State Act, and that is the Prime Minister. So the Prime Minister exists in law, it's under the Ministers of State Act, and the title of Prime Minister is a convention passed by the Governor General to that person. The Prime Minister is also referred to in many, many Acts of Parliament. If you look at the Administrative Arrangements Order, the Prime Minister is given a lot of responsibilities by the Governor General to carry out certain Acts of Parliament. Also, the Prime Minister's office spends money. And if you know your uh, Williams One, the uh, Executive Branch cannot spend money unless it is provided for by law. That is, they can't take it out through the Consolidated Revenue Fund. Uh, the PM does it all the time. He's responsible for a large amount of legislation to be carried out, and in order to do that, he needs money. Just check to see if there's any questions. Still no questions. So I don't know if anyone can hear me. Assuming somebody would have said by now, we can see the lips moving, but nothing's coming out. Actually, somebody did. Excuse me, I'm just taking a break. And nothing to do with this. All right. Motions of no confidence. Um, I've covered a couple of items here about what students might get right or might get wrong, and I've included a little bit of history for you as well, because we all love that. Technically, no Prime Minister has lost a motion of no confidence on the floor of the House. Now, students will refer to Fadden, losing confidence, which then led to the Curtin administration coming into office during World War II. Um, Fadden didn't face a motion of no confidence. What he actually faced was an alteration to a money bill, and that alteration was by one pound. 
but it was deemed at the time that to have a money bill altered was seen as a loss of confidence and therefore he resigned his government and governor general gowrie then asked the crossbench if they would support that that is the two crossbench members who had supported uh, fadden's uh, minority government in 1941 if uh, they would support uh, John Curtin, and they did, and that is why Curtin was able to become Prime Minister with, uh, in the first instance without having to face election. Um, governments may also resign, excuse me, sorry, Dane, it's over there. Governments may also resign on a central policy issue. Uh, this has occurred uh, four times to my knowledge. Uh, twice in 1904, that was a doozy of a year. Um, once in 1929 and the other one in 1941. Students don't need to know it. But if they are going to be looking at the conditions under which the executive branch will resign, um, it will be not because they've lost a motion of no confidence in the House. That's not happened. It's because they have either had um, a significant piece of legislation uh, amended on the floor, that would be a money bill, or that the government is unable in the lower House to get a central issue they took to an election passed, and therefore they would go to an election um, to try to get what they want covered through the chamber. I'll also point out that times have changed. So the Medivac legislation of 2018, because Medivac or the circumstances uh, in part around Medivac weren't possibly a central tenet of coalition policy, um, keeping Australia's borders closed and those seeking asylum by unlawfully entering the country were, Medivac was moving into that territory, but it wasn't quite the same as undoing government policy. Now, um, Medivac was legislation which passed against the government's desire uh, in 2018, proposed by the opposition and supported by the crossbench, uh, a crossbench that had given its commitment to confidence. So therefore, the government knew that while it was losing Medivac, uh, it would continue to enjoy the confidence of the House. So Medivac might be an example of losing on the floor, but it would not be an example of a government needing to resign. I've, I've added in here that teachers need to be aware um, that forming government is about confidence. Uh, generally speaking, we will teach us that it's forming government is whoever can command a majority. But if you look at 2010-13 and Morrison's shaky few months, it's actually not about just the majority. It's the majority that can form a confidence or a crossbench that can give confidence. And I will talk about that when I look at Parliament thesis in a moment. I think that's next. So Parliament thesis, um, frankly, Parliament thesis is one of those two areas of the course I find that students can get themselves really hung up on, the other being IMR and CMR. Parliament thesis is the idea that Parliament fulfills a range of theoretical functions uh, to legislate, to represent, to scrutinise governments, and to be a forum for debate, the big ones. For me, I teach a fifth, and that is the formation of government. Um, so, first up, the notion of the decline of Parliament thesis. In order for something to decline, it needed to have been at an advantageous point from the beginning. Uh, I think a lot of political historians would agree that Parliament in Australia has always met the cut and thrust of the bear pit, as we like to call it. That uh, Parliament has never always been perfectly polite and civilised and behaved as, I think our textbook for Plewa has it, behaved as a club. It is a bear pit and always has been. The language used has changed. The strategies and tactics have changed. But fundamentally, Parliament is about power and who's going to have it. And it's not changed really from that objective since 1901. What has changed, I would argue, is that Parliament probably improved. The more diverse representation of the Senate brought about by um, both uh, electoral and voting system changes over the 20th century have led to a Senate that executive dominance isn't there and through executive dominance a really angry opposition that can't get its way. What we now have is that we have a government that rarely controls the Senate, but by courtesy sits on the, on the president's right and gets to appoint the presiding officer. Uh, we have an opposition that very rarely gets to genuinely frustrate government objectives in the Senate. And we have a group of crossbenchers who get to fundamentally decide whether government policy can pass or not. So I would argue that Parliament's not declined because it was never perfect in the first place. But I would say that it's possibly improved because the Senate, through its legislative and scrutiny functions, are certainly better than they were in the first half of Federation. Once again, I'll add to this point, please don't let students romanticise about the joys of the contemporary Senate. The Senate is a political chamber. The politicians in there have all got their own goals. And when they're not fighting politicians from other political parties, they're fighting each other within their own political party. The Senate 
should be seen as one that has improved our understanding of how Parliament fulfills its functions, but it is by no means a perfect chamber. Um, minority governments, uh, twice in the last 10 years, which is quite relevant to the idea of, uh, of recent, when we use that term in the course, um, has made Parliament thesis better. Certainly past speakers um, under the Gillard government said that one of the great things about minority government was that government couldn't really run away from answering questions. So minority government has improved the formation of government and it's improved, improved the role uh, of parliament thesis. Governments have to answer questions. They don't necessarily get to dominate um, committees in the lower house, et cetera, et cetera, which means that they are scrutinized more effectively. I would also add that where we have minority governments, we should add the idea that parliament thesis is more than four points, we have the fifth. Most people talk about executive scrutiny. I also add to it that we are a system of responsible government. Government is formed from the lower house. When you have um, no political party able to exert executive dominance, then it is the house that will determine the formation of government. And therefore, in the last 10 years, parliament thesis has probably improved rather than declined. I think there was a question. I'm sorry if I got to it. How about Fraser? I'm not too sure what that means. Ben, if you could give me some more information on how about Fraser, that'd be good. And I'll try and answer it. I don't know if I have the question for it. I was alive when he was prime minister, but I was quite young. So Ben, uh, happy to answer it. I just need to get some more information. Okay, ministerial resignations. Big mistake students make is they love to cite propagate. Bronwyn Bishop flying into Geelong in a helicopter for all to see, outdoing the bride, uh, had to stand down from uh, her very comfortable seat as the Speaker of the House of Representatives. This is not ministerial. Uh, this is a presiding officer. So Bronwyn Bishop and Peter Slipper in relation to texting scandals, neither of them are ministerial resignation example. You need to be looking um, at uh, a series of government ministers um, and their reasons for resignations. Uh, I'm thinking uh, Sportsgate scandals, um, those ministers who step down from portfolios, uh, such as the insulation bat scheme, uh, Jamie Briggs comes up a fair time. Their ministers, please make sure your students don't cite presiding officers. Also, um, Craig Thompson is a gift for a long time that kept on giving. He was never a minister, and yet even to this day, we will no doubt have students in the ATAR exam talk about ministerial resignations and how Craig Thompson, through his improper use of credit card, which by the way, had nothing to do with parliament. It was his time as an, as a, an employee in a different organization. If anything for Thompson, it was his abuse of parliamentary privilege and the House of Reps in its magnificent way of pursuing parliamentary privilege took a couple of years to work that one out after he'd left parliament. I'll probably be cited now for breaching parliamentary privilege for criticizing him. And my last slide, human rights. I have got something, I think it's back from Ben. I mean, as a PM who lost a vote of no confidence, he didn't resign, his convention would dictate. Ben, I'll take that as a question with notice. I'll pretend I'm a minister assisting in the Senate and I will look that up. I did research extensively to look up um, uh, votes of confidence and according to the parliamentary website, no prime minister has lost a vote of confidence on the floor of the house, but I'm more than happy to look that up. And if that's the case, we'll make an adjustment to uh, this slide, but that is news to me. Um, and now just going over, there's actually a few more. Here we go. Uh, post in second, while he was caretaker prime minister. Oh, actually that's, I see what you mean, Ben. Um, in this instance, no, there was a motion of confidence that passed the House of Representatives, but it didn't reach the governor. Um, I would actually, if, if a student was to say that uh, tech, in theory, a prime minister has lost a motion of no confidence, and that was Fraser on the floor of the House of Representatives, uh, I would say very good. I would seriously consider giving it marks, but I'd have to just double check. I think the Governor General had already issued the writs to dissolve. I'm getting some nods from Cheryl that the Governor General had issued the, um, the writs to dissolve the House of Representatives, so its motion. Um, may not have even been um, properly constituted because the House should not have been sitting. Either that, it certainly did not reach the Governor-General. By the time it reached the GG, the House was no longer an effective force. It was spent under Section 5, and so therefore any decision pending the Governor-General's approval was void at that point. I hope that answers your question, Ben. I'd steer students away from that one because it's pretty funny. But it's a really good one to make, and I'm gonna look that one up tonight because I've got nothing else to do. And there's another question. Yep, you're welcome. Thanks, Ben. 
Uh, human rights. Uh, human rights. I really encourage my students not to do human rights essays because they write really great English essays on how they feel. Um, you know, really great university pamphlets come out of, uh, of these essays. First up, uh, Australia has an outstanding record on human rights protections. Uh, Cato Institute ranks us number five out of 162. I think Human Rights Watch ranks us number two. Uh, ultimately, such indices are actually going to be determined by the, by the culture of the country in which those indices are formed. Some countries value particular things more than others, but fairly consistently what comes through that is Australia is an excellent source of human rights protection. Historically, it may not have been good at the moment. It's considered, and for certainly a number of years, it's been seen as a pinnacle of human rights protection and a role model for the world. Um, we don't have um, a Bill of Rights. And in that, a lot of people do seem to, a lot of students do stress that we don't have a Bill of Rights, therefore um, our human rights protections can't be good. My preference, my preferred way of talking about human rights protection is to refer to a culture of human rights. Given that our entire political system is predicated by convention, so are our human rights protections. They are predicated by a convention or a culture of a fair trial of democratic, uh, liberal democratic principles, etc. that when breached cause outrage in our community. We also have a body politic that for all its party politics and for all its desire for power actually genuinely values human rights protections and genuinely values the liberal democracy we live in. Um, some people might call me an optimist, but I, I actually think we have a very strong liberal democratic culture in our country. And that is why we record so high as protecting human rights. I could also bring in there, uh, lots of countries have, have bills of human rights. My students in year 11 study North Korea and they have a great laugh at their human rights protections according to their constitution. And then when you actually look at what life is like in there. So students make the mistake of, of assuming A, that we're poor at protecting human rights because somewhere along the way, someone has told them great stories about how terrible we are or have been. In actual fact, we're very good at protecting human rights and it's internationally recognized. And second, students will use the lack of a Bill of Rights um, as evidence that we're not good at protecting them. I would counter that with culture of human rights protection is actually very, very strong. Um, on this one, I would appeal to politics and law teachers. You are the authority of, um, academic politics and Australian political history in your school. Uh, I certainly do hear teachers from out of my learning area uh, expressing strong political opinions on things that are based on pamphlets, based on something they've read somewhere. And so I spent a lot of time trying to actually reinforce what the actual truth is. I, I put that out to you as politics and law teachers, know what the truth of Australian politics is, know what the truth of our history is, and make sure that our students are well informed about what those things are. That is the end of my presentation. So it went for about 45 minutes, a little bit less than I expected, but I'm very happy to take some more questions. Uh, and if I have a seventh one up here. Nope, I don't, I don't have a seventh one. I've got everything from Ben. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pause this for about a minute or two and uh, see if any of you have got any questions you wanna ask me. Okay, I'm now going back. I have a hand up from Denise, so I'm gonna unmute Denise to hear your question. Dane, it's not working. Dane, you're not helping. It's refusing to unmute. Here we go, here we go. I think I've got it now. It's no, no, Hi, no, it's all right. I'll leave it, leave it, leave it. No, okay. I've got you, I can hear you now, Denise. Yeah, I know, but leave it. No leave worries. It. It's only okay, about the, yeah, yeah, it's only about question time. Doesn't matter, I'll think about it a bit more. Okay, we've still got a few minutes there, so think about it. Hmm. I'll just mute again. Um, what I might do is I might go through there. Um, Alex Tembi, is all good for you? Alex. 
Oh, you might not have microphone. Um, I won't continue to do that. Then. I'll just let people put their hand up. Um, someone's got their hand up. Uh, Denise, if you could just take your hand down, please. Thanks. There we go. Thank you. Okay. Anything else? I can do some Plewa news. Okay. Close it down. Mm. Right. Okay. I'm now getting some some whispered advice from the advisors over here. Lisa Reinders, who doesn't want to be noticed, um, says everyone needs to buy a copy of the Good Answer Guide. I absolutely endorse that. Get class sets if you can. And sorry, Cheryl's Cheryl's just doing hand signals at me, and I don't understand. It is available now. Yep. Okay. Exam orders for year 11 and year 12. Okay. Sorry, everyone. I'm, I'm actually, I actually can't see myself anymore. So I don't know if they can see me, but I'm, I'm getting advice from here. So year 11 exams orders come out next week. Yep. Orders will be online next week for the PLEWA exams. They are excellent exams uh, with marking keys. And I do know that the year 11 exam now has a new feature. I don't know, I'll be publishing the new feature. The rationale. Uh, we've explained why, material, I see your hand there. We've actually explained why we're asking the questions we're asking in the year 11 exam. So it links really well to students understanding for year 12 that they understand that the questions we're asking are important. I've got a hand up. Sorry, that was Cheryl's phone giving her directions on where to go. Um, Materia, sorry, Tom's and Loves, are they the cases recording? Yes, they are. Um, uh, the cases that uh, in, involve uh, people who were not seen as having Australian citizenship but because they claimed Aboriginality. Uh, now, one of them, Tom's, I think is the one that has since proven Aboriginality under the Marbo tripartite test but the other is yet to do so. So therefore, their stay from being deported from Australia is, I think, still in effect. Denise uh, asks, what is the impact on democracy if you are defining parliament? That's, um, that's a very big question. Um, no. Um, uh, question that's all. Okay, Denise, I've actually got you off audio, uh, on, off mute, so we can hear you. Um, the impact on democracy, oh, gee, I am not prepared for that. That's a really long essay answer that I would give. Um, yeah, I'll take it as a question without notice, Denise, and I will look to add something onto this slide, which um, we'll be putting up on the PLEWA website, I think tomorrow or early next week. That would require quite something. Fundamentally, you, you I think, think that you're asking, um, is our system of responsible government democratic? Um, my answer would be, it, it is. Um, what is its impact on democracy? I think most Australians are, are very comfortable with the fact that in voting for their lower house in the legislature, they know that they are voting for the government of the day. Um, through the parliament and of course um, should the government not have a strong majority then democracy may kick in very nicely and you could actually see changes in government as you did uh, with Fadden and Curtin. That's, that's, that's the Okay, thanks Denise. Yes. Okay, I've got another one, question time related. Okay, sorry I'm actually just scrolling through. Thank you. I'll take that with notice, Denise. I'm trying to work out uh, how best to answer that. Nearly five o'clock, my brain's fairly tired, but I will try to put something up there for you. Uh, feel free to email me. If you work for the department, just look up Alex Rosevier. Uh, if you work for private sector, I will just add my email address to the front slide. I just made that way too big. So if you have any questions, you can send that question to me, Denise, and I'll try and give a more detailed answer as well. Okay, um, I'll just look one more time. Witness K trial, don't know about the witness K trial, Ben. Um, it's a rule of law question from Cheryl and Lisa, do you either want to talk about it? Uh, 
Is the, uh, what I'm going to ask is, are there misconceptions about Witness K? It's still going. The case is still ongoing, so we, you wouldn't be expected to refer to it. And it was recently... There we go. The, if you go to the PLEWA website, Ben, there is something on Witness K trial. It's something I'm going to have to look up. There are so many cases to know. Uh, Sean Hindley, uh, how significantly did the leadership changes during the last day, decade affect parliamentary cases? Um, look, they certainly affected the, the functions and performance of parliament because of the flow on effects. The, um, the loss of Rudd to, to Gillard led to an election um, which had a profound impact on the government uh, in that it was returned uh, without a majority. Uh, that in itself therefore changed the parliamentary performance because now there was a government that was being very effectively scrutinised by an opposition that was enhanced, um, that was weakened by a crossbench that could change its mind at any point. So the leadership themselves don't directly affect parliament thesis. It's in when the leadership changes lead to other things such as um, uh, Gillard calling an election or Turnbull calling election and the, the public punishing the political party that was in government leading to a diminished government uh, for Gillard minority, for Turnbull one seat majority, that emboldened the rest of the chamber to um, hold the government much more effectively to account. So it really improved its executive uh, accountability mechanism. Um, also, I think you, would, you could look at it from the point of view that the prime minister may be, uh, be appointed within their party, um, Oh, this is really going back. The Prime Minister is appointed by their party to lead, uh, but they still have to have the support of the Chamber. And if you want to look at William Hughes, Billy Hughes, he was dumped by his own party in 1918 as Prime Minister, went to the opposition, formed the United Australia Party and retained the position as Prime Minister, but now leader of a completely different political party. Uh, that would really have a fun time with parliamentary thesis and our system of representative government. I could do a whole different presentation on Billy Hughes, the longest serving member of parliament in Australian history, a really interesting man. So Sean, hopefully I've answered your question in that it is that the leadership changes shouldn't directly affect parliament thesis, it's the flow on effect that once an election is called shortly after for a prime minister to confirm their rights to be in government. Uh, if they don't get a clear majority, um, then it will certainly weaken their performance and the executive branch will be held accountable much more effectively. Just ask Tony Abbott. I'm gonna see if there's any more with this, okay. Uh, I've asked a human rights question, Ben, scroll up, okay. While I agree with your assessment of human rights being generally excellent, would it be fair to teach? Absolutely, Ben, absolutely, I do agree with that at all. We do need to cover those. I wouldn't uh, want to gloss over um, uh, the idea that our human rights are perfect. There are certainly some significant issues uh, that arise with human rights protections. Um, Aboriginal uh, people in remote communities uh, in relation to uh, processes of the law is a significant area and access to the law. Um, those kinds of issues are the ones which come up uh, and for asylum seekers as well. And I'm glad you used the term asylum seeker. It is a technical distinction from that of refugee. So. Thank you for your question. You are right. I've probably made Australia look perfect. It's not. There are problems and students must certainly know what problems continue to exist. I would just ask them not to wax lyrical about them. Um, uh, would Barnaby Joyce resigning be an example of ministerial resignations? Anonymous attendee. Yes, he had to. Well, he resigned because he wasn't Oh, uh, actually, I'm seeing it from two points of view. He had to resign because he wasn't fit to be a member of parliament under section 44I, but he also resigned, of course, because of an extramarital affair, which didn't meet um, what we would call the pub test, that probity and propriety. I think in this instance, it's probity. Yep, it's propriety. It's propriety. His behaviour was not seen as befitting a, uh, a deputy prime minister or a person holding senior office. So, yep, Barnaby Joyce is definitely a... a, a Recent, not contemporary, but recent example of ministerial resignations. Yeah, personal behaviour. You're welcome, Ben. Thank you for your questions. Yes. There is a ministerial, res I've actually used it. There is a ministerial resignations website and it does, you're right. And it uh, makes for interesting reading. A hell of a lot of ministers have resigned.
Senator Matt Canavan, the most recent one. Uh, and that's actually, Lisa's just told us that Senator Matt Canavan uh, disputed policy with party leader under collective ministerial responsibility, he needs to resign and he did so. But what I've done, what, I've, what I aimed to do with this presentation was um, teach where we go wrong or where our students go wrong by talking about things which are not true or by having a very weak understanding of something, uh, failing to have a complex understanding or trying to simplify something. That was the purpose of the idea. Hopefully I've gotten a lot of those ones out of the way. I want to thank um, Dane Williams, Lisa Rainders and Cheryl Connell for uh, helping set everything up and proofing my work.